Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to provide some context for this presentation. The goal of ENGAGE is to increase the capacity of engineering schools to retain undergraduate students by facilitating the implementation of research-based strategies to improve the day-to-day -day educational experience. Our focus is on first and second year students because as you also probably know, these students are most likely to switch out of engineering. The, stra the engaged strategies are to improve and increase interaction between faculty and students, uh, using everyday examples in engineering to teach technical concepts, and the topic of today's webinar, strategy three, improve spatial visualization skills of students with weaker skills. So we've selected these strategies because they improve student interest and engagement in engineering. So now I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Cheryl Sorby. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us. A recent report just came out from the National Science Foundation. And the title of the report is called Preparing the Next Generation of Innovators. And in this report, they bring out that Innovators typically have strong spatial skills as well as strong verbal and math skills. And they, throughout this report, they expressed the need to look merely beyond verbal and math skills when identifying STEM talent because spatial skills are so important to success. This is the test we give during um, freshman orientation at Michigan Tech. The purpose of the test is you have an object on the top line here. This object has been rotated in space. You need to rotate this in space by the same amount and then choose what it would look like if it underwent the same rotation. And in this case, the answer to this is D. So <clears throat> at Michigan Tech, we test our students during freshman orientation, our engineering students, that is. And approximately 10 to 15 percent of our students fail that Purdue test, the test that you took the a question from previously during orientation. Approximately about 10 percent of the male students fail the test, but nearly one-third of the female students, and sometimes it's been as high as 40 percent. So you can see that um, this is a problem that really impacts women more than it does men. And from studies conducted by the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation, they tested 64,000 professionals who were out there working in the field and they found that the engineers here are, are at the left end here along with the architects right next to them but the engineers and architects need to have the have the best developed spatial skills compared to all these other occupations and most of the things on the left end here are all within um, the STEM disciplines. The gender differences are robust and consistent. We found this time and again. We have, like I said, at Michigan Tech, we test our engineering students every year during orientation. And you can see we have data going back to 1996. And the, the, the other thing you need to know is that this dot here represents about 100 students, and this dot here represents about 700 students. So this gender gap here between men and women is highly, highly statistically significant. Um, and you can see it goes along pretty much every year we have the same gap in spatial skills between um, men and women. So as I said, we got funding from the National Science Foundation in 1992 to, to develop a course. We got a second grant in 1998 to develop multimedia software and a workbook. We've been offering a spatial skills class at Michigan Tech since 1993 without fail. And from the period of 1993 to 2008, students who failed the Purdue test during orientation were encouraged to enroll in the course, but they weren't um, required to. Uh, based on the data that we have, the engineering chairs at Michigan Tech uh, made a change starting in 2009 so that now all students who fail the Purdue test are required to enroll in the spatial skills course. And we define failure as scoring 60% or lower on the Purdue test. The course looks like this. We meet for one, one and a half hour lab session each week. It's a one credit course. 
We start with a short mini lecture of 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, then they, the students will work through the software module for that day in teams of two, typically, and they complete the workbook pages for the remainder of time. Um, uh, most of the time they do that as a kind of a team effort also, but not always. This is what the um, software looks like, and I'm showing you this because you can see then the types of topics that we offer in the class. We do isometric drawings orthographic drawings, we do rotations, and combining solids. And so this is pretty much the outline for the course. We do one of these modules each week. If we look at gains on this test, the Purdue test up here, the original course was when Michigan Tech was on quarters. This is from uh, 1993 to 1999. The modified course is when we were on semesters. And um, this data is actually just from 2000 to 2002. We see similar results nearly every year. Um, but you can see that the students started at about a 50% and they ended up in the mid-70s at the end of the spatial skills course. And what I'd like to point out about this is that this, these numbers here, this 70, middle 70% 70 average, this is approximately what the average is for engineering students um, for all engineering students when we test them during orientation. So we, we basically are taking students who are way behind in their spatial skills and bringing them up so that they're about average with their peers in the engineering courses. And you can see the significance of the gain, um, highly um, statistically significant through every year we get a statist statistically significant gain. We've done several longitudinal studies um, to look at the long-term impact of this course. And the types of things we've looked at are grades and uh, retention rates. For students who failed the Purdue test and then went on to enroll in the spatial skills course, what we have found is that they earned better grades in a variety of courses listed here. Calculus as well as pre-calculus, chemistry, computer science, engineering and graphics, physics, and that their overall GPA is higher when compared to students who failed the Purdue test but did not enroll in the course. So you can see um, from this data right here, these are the students who enrolled in the spatial skills course. These are the students who, again, failed the Purdue test but did not enroll in the spatial skills course. These are our students with weak spatial skills. They had a statistically higher grade in all of these courses, except uh, chemistry is not so significant as the others. And they ended up with a higher GPA than the students who had weak spatial skills and didn't go through the, uh, the intervention. We also looked at the students who failed the Purdue test and enrolled in the course and compared them to, the, again, the students who pa failed the Purdue test and did not enroll in the course, but also those who passed the Purdue test with a score between 60 to 70 percent. So they, they kind of got it. They were a D student in spatial skills, but they did pass with, um, with our cutoff. And you can see, again, these students who had the spatial skills training had significantly higher uh, grade point average or, or average grades than the students who passed the Purdue test with a marginal score between 60 and 70 percent. And they're, again, much higher than the students who failed the Purdue test and did not enroll in the course. If we look just at the computer science, you can see that the students who took the spatial skills course, who needed it, had an average grade of just above a B in the course. And the students who passed with a marginal score had about a C plus, And the students who failed got um, a solid C in the course. And you see the same kind of trend in their overall GPAs. So um, some of you might be out there saying, yeah, but there's self-selection bias in that. Because prior to 2009, the students who enrolled in the course chose to do so. Um, so I have some very preliminary results. And the, and the reason I say they're very preliminary is that we've only looked at a few grades and a few courses. We are going to be continuing this and hope to publish on this um, in the coming months. But let's look at the data when we don't have the self-selection bias. Again, the students who failed the Purdue test and underwent the spatial skills training 
did better in one of their engineering courses as well as in their calculus course than the students who marginally passed the Purdue test with a score of 60 to 70 percent. As I said earlier, we also looked at retention rates in our longitudinal studies. And the, again, these are some of the general findings that we obtained. So students who failed the Purdue test and enrolled in the spatial skills course were retained both at the university and within engineering at higher rates than those who failed and did not enroll in the course and those who passed with a, a marginal score of 60 to 70 percent. And these results are particularly true for women. For the students who took the course, they stayed in engineering at about 65 percent compared to about 40 percent for the students who failed and did not take the spatial skills course. Uh, the students who failed the Purdue test and took the course, these are their retention rates within, um, at the university. And um, for the people who passed with a score of 60% or higher, these are their retention rates. These are not statistically significant differences. However, this, for the women who failed the Purdue test and did not take the course, uh, we do see a statistically significant difference between these students and these students. For the men, we see similar trends. However, none of these are statistically significant. However, they are encouraging that we are also, um, we also appear to be retaining more men through this spatial skills intervention. So in conclusion, well-developed math and verbal skills are readily recognized as being necessary to success in engineering. Um, according to this recent publication by the NSB, perhaps we should also add spatial skills to this list. We, at the university, or at my university anyway, we do not encourage students not ready for calculus to enroll in calculus for their first semester. Shouldn't spatial skills training be available for those who need the help? And at Michigan Tech, we believe that we have helped students be more successful in engineering by offering them an opportunity to develop their spatial skills. So based on all, this result, all these results, what can you do or what should you do? One of the things that you should think about doing is assessing the spatial skill level of your incoming engineering students. And through this assessment, you will identify those who have weak skills and target your efforts just at those students. What would I recommend that you don't do? I wouldn't provide spatial skills training to all of your students. Those who don't need it may be bored, and those who do need it may become even more discouraged. Um, if they're in the class and they see that something is super easy for somebody else in the class, they might start to have uh, feelings of self-doubt and their, what's called their self-efficacy will be diminished. Self-efficacy being just your internal belief that, yes, I can do something. And I would not offer voluntary spatial skills help sessions because it has been shown time and again throughout educational research, not just me, but people in math and in chemistry and other places, that voluntary supplemental instruction never works. You only get a few people who attend regularly. And um, if you're going to do something, I, I would say you would want to do it in the most effective way. Formats that you might consider for helping students develop spatial skills. Offer a course like we do at Michigan Tech. A course for credit, though. Um, you could have required supplemental instruction sessions or required tutoring sessions, similar to requiring tutors, tutoring sessions for students with weak max, math skills, if your university allows you to do that. Not all of them do. You could provide spatial skills training as part of a summer course or a summer bridge program. Uh, or you, one other thing is you could integrate spatial skills training into a required course. But I would only use that approach if most of your students have weak spatial skills and not only if a small percentage um, have the poor spatial skills. Because again, you don't want the students who have the weak spatial skills, which at Michigan Tech is about 10% of the student body, to feel even more discouraged by watching people um, have fun and doing things that um, is very easy to them. And here's my final reflection. Uh, and I hear this all the time, engineering faculty don't want to add one additional credit to an already full curriculum. So I'm leaving you with a question, which is better, um, asking students to take one extra credit 
that improves their chances of success in engineering by a significant margin, or is it better to ignore the problem and help your students survive to graduation? And in the long run, which one is really more costly? If the, if the students leave your university and they're not spending those tuition dollars, um, that is a true cost to the university. Further, it's a cost to the individual because now um, they might be uh, studying, they might never finish college or they might be studying something um, that um, they're not as interested in. 